three of this conversation that we've been calling Mastermind, and we've been exploring this thing up here that seems to have an effect on all other things in our life, right? And we've been pushing this one central idea over and over and over again, and I don't know if you've bought it yet, and hopefully in the next little bit, or if you come back for next week, I can convince you that there's something to this. It's this idea, if you change your thinking, you change your life. If you change how you process things, how you navigate things, how you categorize things, how you see things, how you think, that will change everything. Because your brain is this amazingly powerful thing. I, I don't know how God came up with it. That's why he's God and I'm not. But when you think about the impact that it has and the ability that it has to rearrange everything for us, it's pretty astounding. And then... This idea that it can have a conversation with itself, <laughs> it can have a battle with itself, because we've said our, our minds are a battlefield, right? This is the part of you that's, that's going, this is, I can see this positively, but then quickly the other half chimes in and goes, no, it's really negative, or this is the part of you that, you know, I can come up with a strategy, and then the other part of you goes, it'll never work, and we go back and forth with ourselves. We have more conversations with us than anybody else in a given day, and What's amazing, too, is whatever you put into it somehow, some way plays out in your life. Have you noticed this? I mean, the things you spend the most time thinking about play out every day, sometimes in a sideways kind of way, in a way that you wouldn't want, but it always bubbles back out. But for all the bad it can do, it can do an awful lot of good as well. And that's something to celebrate. That's something to be thankful for. And to remember that over and over in the scriptures we see reference to our minds and that they're a good thing and can be used for good things. And that we're not prisoners to our brain, contrary to what we might naturally believe. You'll remember Paul, I mean of all people who had a right to kind of have a negative scope for all of life, had a rather positive one, and he put it this way in his letter to the Corinthians. He said, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons. So we we plug into who God is and what he makes available to us to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning or human thinking. The strongholds, the prisons that captivate us and hold us back from living the life that God would want us to live and that ultimately we would want to live and to destroy false arguments. I love the notion that it destroys things. God's power can destroy whatever's holding you captive in your mind, those thoughts that seem to reoccur. It's not can shut them down for a minute. It's not can make them a little more quiet. It's not they can take them back a few notches. It's destroy, level, be done, it's over, there's no coming back. God's power has the ability to do that in your life and in your mind. He can destroy, demolish the things that hold you back. Which leads to what has become my favorite kind of sentence maybe in all of the scriptures because it's one of those that we memorized when we were young. We talked about this probably a a couple weeks ago. And because you memorized it when you were young, you just fly through it. You know the words, so you fly through it. But it has such a profound truth hidden right in the middle of it. Paul wrote this to the Romans. He says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, and we all go, easier said than done. Paul says, but let God transform you. How? Into a new person by changing the way you think. It's amazing to me, he doesn't say, be transformed by just believing it. He doesn't say be transformed by having just bigger, crazier faith. He doesn't say be transformed by reading more books even. He says be transformed, have your mind renewed, think differently. So all the danger that resides up here has an awful lot of good and is an integral part of what it means for us to follow Jesus, for us to to be the people that God wants us to be. So for Ever, we thought that our brains were fixed. For centuries, scientists and sociologists and psychologists believe that once you get out of adolescence, and that age has changed over the years, but once you get out of it, your, your brain kind of becomes this fixed thing. It solidifies, and you are always going to think that way. But what we've learned 
recently is that there's this neuroplasticity idea that you can actually change the shape of your brain by creating neuro, new neural pathways. And I want to introduce you to an idea today that is a part of that and really important for us to be aware of because we're gonna, if we're going to be successful in changing the way we think, we have to know that something is happening all of the time. And it's this principle, it's called cognitive bias. Think of cognitive bias, or, or sometimes when it's put into action, it becomes confirmation bias. But cognitive bias is this lens or this filter that you and I see all of life through. What's odd is that you, you don't even know all the time that you see it through that filter. But each of us, because of how our brains are shaped and our upbringing and our experience in life, we see the world in a very kind of specific way. And what we'll do is we'll find things to prove that we're right about how we see the world. Think of it like this. If you can remember all the way back to the, to the mid-90s, for some of us that's a longer stretch than others, right? But, well, I guess no matter how old you are, it's the same stretch back to the mid-90s. Some of you just weren't here yet. Uh, but there was a great product introduced to the world that was supposed to revolutionize how we navigated the outside world when the sun was shining, and they were called blue blockers. Do you remember blue blockers? They were sunglasses that, that, well, they looked just like these ones. And blue blockers are weird sunglasses to me because they don't have a dark lens, they have an orange one. And if you put them on, they say that you're supposed to be able to see things clearly. All I see are orange people. And everything becomes more orange when you put these on. But, and so this is cognitive bias. It's a filter that's on our minds through which we think everything. And can you imagine if I was born wearing these sunglasses? Imagine a cute baby little Josh with these huge sunglasses. I would never, ever know that this was not how the world was. I'd never know it. It would just be how I saw things. And you might come up to me and you would say, well, that's not actually orange. That's this color. And I'd say, no, that's orange. I've seen that my whole life, and that's how it looks. It's just the filter I see it through. So here's the principle and the reality for each of us that, we, that we've got to come to grips with. None of us see the world as it is. None of us. We see it how we see it. And I know there's some really smart people who have everything figured out, and they're sitting in this room. And you believe in your heart of hearts that, no, I see the world as it is. But what you've maybe never considered is that you have a filter just like the rest of us. And you see the world how you see it because of that filter. And the more aware we become of this, the more we have the ability to do what's called reframing. This is the practice I want to introduce you to today that I believe was practiced over and over and over again in the scriptures. And here's how reframing works, is that you change the way you see something by changing what it means. You change the way you see something by rearranging its meaning, and you begin to see it differently. So it's like you have the same picture that's always been there, but you put a different frame on it, and all of a sudden it looks entirely different. It's like you take the filter off the light and you put a different filter on. All of a sudden, you see things differently. So if I could pop these orange lenses out and I put in blue lenses, everything's going to change because I've reframed the picture. It makes me think about this little boy who loved baseball. And he believed that one day he would grow up to be the greatest hitter of all time. He would surpass Babe Ruth. He would surpass Mark McGuire, if you can count him, right? Like, baseball joke, right? Like, there's all kinds of guys. And he just thought, I am already, because I'm going to be, I'm already actually the greatest hitter of all time. And so he got his bat and his baseball, and he went out to the backyard, and he tossed the ball up in the air and took the biggest swing that he could and missed. Ball hit the floor. Decides he's going to try again because he's the greatest hitter of all time. And the great hitters keep on swinging, right? So he picks up the ball, tosses it up in the air, takes a swing, misses again. Ball hits the ground. 
the greatest hitters never give up, and you get three strikes. So he picks the ball up one more time, tosses it into the air, keeps his eye on the ball, takes as big a swing as he possibly can, and whiffs it for the third time. And you would think that that little boy would walk away and go, I must not be the greatest hitter because I couldn't even hit the ball one out of three times. But you know what he said instead? I must be the greatest pitcher to ever live too because I just struck out the greatest hitter of all time. You see, what that little boy did was he decided he was changing the meaning. The meaning of the ball hitting the ground, the ball hitting the ground three times was not that he struck out. It's that he struck out the greatest hitter. He reframed. It was a whole new filter, a whole new way of thinking. And this principle, I believe, is fundamental to the Christian worldview. I think it's fundamental to following Jesus because it will reframe everything. He will change the filter forever. So bottom line for today, the thing I hope you hear, and if you forget everything else, I just, this one thing. Like if you're going to get a tattoo that reminded you of the message, it would be this sentence. We can't control what happens to us, but we can control how we frame it. There's nothing, I cannot give you, here are five simple steps to never have a bad thing happen in your life. I, just, I can't. And no book can. If they promise you that, false advertising. You just can't do anything about what's going to come across your path in life. But you get to decide what it means. You get to decide how you see it. And this is the lesson from Paul's life. We've come back to Paul every single week in this discussion because he did such a phenomenal job of reframing things. For instance, Paul had forever been praying for an opportunity to go to Rome. He knew that Rome in that day and age was the center of the world. And if he could get the gospel planted in Rome, everything flowed out from there. And that meant the gospel would too. So he was just begging God over and over again. And he would ask other Christians and other people at the churches that he'd started in other towns, will you pray that I get an opportunity to go to Rome? And at one point in history, he gets that chance. And you know where he ended up? House arrest. Not in churches, not in the public squares, not doing what he believed God had sent him to do. He instead was on house arrest, lock and chain, with a guard around the clock. And in that moment, Paul experienced what you and I experience in almost a daily basis. What we wanted to happen was not what happened. Did you say that today yet? It did. Yeah, when you got up and it was three degrees outside, it's not what you wanted to happen. Over and over again, right? You, you will say this over and over again. This is not what I wanted for my day. This is not what I wanted for my life. This is not what I wanted for my marriage. This is not what I wanted for my kids. This is not what I wanted for my vacation. And nothing goes the way you wanted it to. And you know what we do next? The only reason I know this is because it's what I do next. Where are you at? This is not what I wanted. Where are you at? Why didn't you show up? Why didn't you bless me? Why didn't you make it better? Why didn't you take it away? Why didn't you fix it? I mean, Paul, again, of anybody ever to live could have done that because house arrest is just like the the most recent chapter in his life. He'd already had rocks thrown at him. They'd already tried to push him off a cliff. I mean, they'd already tried to do all kinds of craziness to this guy. And this is what he gets? I mean, he could have he written uh, in his letter to the Philippians, which he wrote from the house arrest, he, he could have put it this way. He could have said, now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me really stinks. And he could have gone on to say, as a result of the hell I've been through, I'm quitting, and I'm never going back to church again. You can read that in Philippians. It's in the New Winers version of the Bible. <laughs> if he'd have written that, none of us, not a single person would have blamed him. 
We would have all gone, you know what, Paul, you really have gone through a lot, and it really does stink, and I totally get that you don't want anything to do with the church ever again. I get that you are going to stop following Jesus because it's gotten nothing but heartache and body ache for you. But that's not what he wrote. And even while he's chained to a Roman guard, Paul reframes the situation in such a profound way. I'll just be totally honest with you. If it had been me, I, na- I, didn't have, I wouldn't have had it in me. Not to write this. This is what he actually writes to the Philippians. I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped me spread the good news. What? For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. Don't tell people that, Paul. You can't tell people that you are in chains because you follow Jesus. Paul says, no, I'm not afraid to tell people. I'm absolutely in chains. I tell people about Jesus. They put me in jail. And he says, and because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. If ever there were anyone that could reframe and see everything through different lenses, this is the guy. Because instead of seeing captivity, what does Paul see? A captive audience. Can you imagine being the Roman guard chained to Paul? Really, you're going to start in on this Jesus guy again? I mean, I bet the guy coming for the next shift is going, oh, man, any other assignment. Just don't chain me up to Paul again captive audience. And instead of seeing a conclusion to his ministry, which I think all of us probably would have thought, like, this is it. This is dead end. There's no more. He saw it as a catalyst to even more. Because he looked at all of the people that were being um, kind of in, in, inflamed with this idea of this could work, this is going to happen, and it's, it's true, and I could go tell people. Because if Paul can do it, and he can have this kind of outlook from a prison cell, essentially, then I could too. It's an amazing ability to think differently about what was going on in his life. And instead of whining about it, instead of seeing it as something bad, he chose to look at it as, here's what God's going to do in me and through me because of this. And that all started because he changed the way he thinks. We can't control what happens to us, but we can control how we frame it. So I was thinking about, well, how do you get in the habit of doing this? Like, how do you create those kinds of neural pathways in your brain where you would start to reshape it around these? Remember, we talked about your, your most dominant thought is going to determine the direction of your life. So how do you start making this your dominant thought more than anything else? I give you three easy, really simple, well, they're not easy, but they're simple principles that I'm trying to rehearse in my own kind of minute-by-minute life. And the first one is this, thank God for what didn't happen. We have such a propensity to talk to God about what did happen, but we never think to say, God, thanks for making sure what could have happened didn't actually happen. It reminds me of the the girl who had come home from college for a break, and she goes to her parents and she says, "Um, I need to talk to you guys. And you probably want to sit down. It's it's not going to be good news. I need to tell you that over the course of the semester, I really um, started partying a lot. Virtually every night of the week, I would go to a party, and I, I got into the habit of drinking pretty heavily at these parties. And one night, I I met a guy, and um, I need to tell you that we slept together, and I'm pregnant. You're going to be grandparents. Uh, But he's going to be a good dad. Um, He's on parole right now, but once once he's he's done, 
where he's really going to be involved in the baby's life, and um, I just hope you can show me some grace. And her parents sit there with their mouths wide open, just shocked and trying to get their head around this whole idea. And, and that all the dad could utter was, are you serious? And the daughter goes, no, I actually got a D in chemistry, but that doesn't seem so bad now, right? <laughs> in that moment, those two parents went, thank you, God, for what didn't happen. So what if we spent a little more time every day? I I don't know that it always works this way, but but sometimes in my head, when I get stuck at a light, when I'm in a rush, and then I get past the light and up ahead there was an accident, I I don't know that it works that way, but sometimes I go, wow, I I guess that could have been me. Thank you, God, for what didn't happen. It it stinks that I'm going to be late. It stinks that I'm stressed out, but thank you that that didn't happen. The second thing is this, practice pre-framing. This is the difference. I, some of you are very vested in some um, sports activities that are going to happen later today. Uh, and that every team decides ahead of time, are we going to play to not lose or are we going to play to win? And what they're doing, when the coach forces them to wrestle with that, they are pre-framing how they're going to approach the game. So we're not going to play it safe. We're not going to just try and keep from making mistakes. We are going to go 100 miles an hour with our hair on fire towards the goal and win this game. And some of us could benefit from taking just a few minutes before the meeting, before the family dinner, before whatever, and just go, here's how I'm going to choose to look at this. I'm going to frame it up by choice and approach it from that perspective. And then the third one, look for God's goodness. Here's what I've come to believe. If you are constantly on the lookout for bad, you will find it 100% of the time. If you are constantly looking for the negative, for the two-faced, for the gossipy, for the fill in the blank, right? If you are always looking for that, you will find it 100% of the time. That's confirmation bias. Because you're going you're gonna to find ways to prove that you were right. But conversely, if you're always looking for good, you'll find it too. And I believe that if you choose to look for God's goodness, if you choose to look for how God is working in your life, you will find it. But you have to decide to go after it. You have to pre-frame every day with God is alive and well and active in my life and he's doing things on my behalf and I will see him today do it. And I have a friend who has taught me more about that than um, maybe most of the people in my life. I met her when my kids were really, really young and they had started into school. Uh, She was their gym teacher. And she was always one of the most positive and joyful people that I had ever met. And then about eight years ago, went through a tragedy that every parent prays and begs God to never have them go through. She lost her 16-year-old son to cancer, but has been doing something incredible since. And she's come today to share her story with you. Will you welcome my friend, Michelle Batts? Hi, Josh. Hey, thanks so much for coming today. Oh, it's a pleasure. I am, I'm excited for everybody to hear your story because it's truly God doing something amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So that day uh, when Corey passed away had to be the worst day of your life. Oh, worst day of our life for Dale and I because he was our only child. And to lose him at 16 and he was healthy, he was doing P90X, and then all of a sudden we get this cancer diagnosis. Um, his faith never failed. Uh, Dale and I were strong for him, but in the end we realized Corey was really strong for us because his faith never wavered. He never had a situation where it was, why me? Why is God doing this to me now? 
I'm 16 years old, going to be independent from mom and dad pretty soon. First job, getting my driver's license. That never crossed his lips. Wow. And he said something pretty powerful to you just before he passed away that you kind of held on to. I imagine rocked you pretty good when he said Rocked me pretty good at the time. We're watching the Olympics. Um, Corey was cleared of cancer for about four weeks, and then the cancer mutated and just came roaring back at him. And we're watching the Olympics when we were going to give another round of chemo to try to knock it out of there. And all of a sudden he says, Mom, Mom, I got to tell you something. And I said, okay. He said, Mom, if this doesn't work out and I die, I don't want you to worry about me. I know where I'm going. I'm going to heaven. And being a mom, you know, I'm first, I, my first thought was, how many parents get to hear that from their child? And then I was going to say something, because that's what I have a tendency to do, is jump right in. He says, I'm not done, Mom. Um, if I do die, don't let it ruin your life. Mm. And it hasn't. Thank God, it hasn't. Yeah. He has glorified what Corey was all about, his mm. faith, his love for people, and we're doing that with Corey's Project now. Yeah, tell us a little about Corey's Project, because when Corey said, don't let it ruin your life, you took it seriously. Took it seriously. This, this has become something really positive in the end for you and your family. So tell us about Corey's project. Yeah, I, um, four months after Corey passed, I always went out for my morning walk, and I kept praying for the kids up at Children's, but then I was asking God, what now? And I kept hearing from him, help. So I came home from my morning walk, and I came in the house, and I said, Dale, it's like four or five weeks before Christmas. What happens if we just ask people to drop off a gift so that we can give love to those kids that are in the cancer unit up at Children's during the holidays? He's okay, so we jumped right in. Well, after four weeks, we raised a thousand gifts in our garage, and we ended up taking uh, four SUVs up there, and we raised four thousand dollars. So we continued this. Well, this past December was our eighth event. And Corey's project raised twenty-eight thousand dollars, and we had nine cartloads full of kids. Yeah, oh. that's amazing. 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 Yeah. How? This is a tough question, but how do you get from this is tragic, mm -hmm. um, probably feeling like my life is over, mm -hmm. to God's going to use this to do big things? I mean, yes, He's telling you go and do this, but emotionally and mentally, how do you get over that? hump, so to speak. Foundation in Christ. Um, sure, you get mad at God, but Dale and I decided not to point fingers at anyone. We decided not to blame anyone, but I've had friends that are upset at God because their plans, like you said today, don't work out. I say scream to God. His shoulders is big enough. He knows the pain you're going through. He made us to have emotions. Sometimes we have to work through those emotions and let yourself mourn. And that's what we, we allowed ourselves to do. We mourned. But then there was a time to rejoice because when you have a foundation in Christ, you know where you are. You know where your loved ones are. And then your mindset changes and you start to think, oh, my God, what did they do today? Who did they see? Did they sit with John the Baptist? Did they see Jesus? Who did they see and that's what sustains us, because when you have a foundation in Christ, you know that earth isn't all. Yeah. There is Jesus waiting for us in his kingdom. Yeah. So in this room, uh, there are people facing really tough things. Maybe mm -hmm. not the same as, as your loss of Corey, but what would be your advice to somebody that's in the middle of that who's trying to go, okay, how do I reframe? How do I see this through a God lens? Um, what, what would you say to them? I would say talk it out, get a, a group of strong supporters. If it's not your family, somebody at work, somebody here at church. But then also start really digging into his word and really lean on him and talk to him. I mean, verbally talk to God. Just don't hold it in your thoughts. And then start looking at different resources that you can obtain, whether it's online or it's, whether it's a book. Uh, one of the books that really helped us, Dale and I, was In Light of Eternity by Randy Alcorn. It gives you a different insight. He studied scriptures for 30 years, and he tells you what is beyond here. And it just gives you a more hopeful, 
joyful attitude to what has happened to you. Because let's face it, we're not going to leave this earth without any trials or bumps along the road. Yeah. So it's your mindset that you have to look at things, uh, why did this happen and what can I do to make it positive? Yeah, you are a living, walking example to us all of what it means to reframe something and instead of seeing something as an end, you saw it as a beginning, a beginning. and God's doing incredible Absolutely. things. Thank you so okay. much Thanks for lot, sharing Jess. with us, Michelle. Thank you. You're the best. You too. You too. You know, I, I knew Michelle as she was going through that, and it was just amazing how even in the midst of it, she had real joy. I'm not talking about fake, like, got to hold up appearances, but real, real joy. And, and here's what she teaches us that I think we all need to get to in our lives. Most of us, most of the time, interpret God through our circumstances. So we look at all that's happened to us, or all that might be on the horizon, and we go, this must be what's true of God. He doesn't care. He's vindictive. He's spiteful. He's angry. He's, you know, a lot of these things. For a lot of us, it's we look at our dad, and we, from like here in real life, and we go, well, that must be what God the Father is like, right? But what we need to get in the habit of doing, because we're going to get a really wrong view of who God is, we need to flip the script, and we need to start to view our circumstances through God. This is what Paul did. He could have said, I'm in prison, I've had people attempt to murder me, I've been kicked out of cities. I've had all these things. God must not really care about me. And instead, he interpreted his circumstances through God. God's going to use this to inspire other believers. God's going to use this to reach the guards that are in charge of me. He's going to use this to reach the authorities in Rome. And he's going to use this to spread the gospel throughout the entire world. You see, what Paul knew in his heart of hearts and believed is what Hebrews records for us, this promise that's true for each of us. God has said, not man, God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. We talked about fear is actually the root of all of this. Worry insecurity, all of it. And so God says, I'm never going to fail you. I'm never going to abandon you. I'm never going to leave you in the lurch. I'm not going to let things happen to you randomly. I will use it. It might seem dark to you. It might seem like the end to you. But for me, it's a whole new beginning. Start to interpret your circumstances through God instead of allowing those circumstances to give you a misrepresentation of him. It's not easy. I'm not pretending. Please don't listen to this and go, oh, nothing bad has ever happened to that guy because he doesn't know what it's like. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying be dismissive of the hard things in your life and pretend like nothing is wrong. I'm saying understand that your heavenly Father loves you and he has made a huge promise here and that nothing in your life is random. Choose to reframe it as more. I, I want to give you maybe the corniest, most, I'm just going to say it, the corniest, most ridiculous, stupid, nerdy thing to do this week. But I, to get my brain to think different, I often got to do things physically different. Um, and so this is what I'm going to challenge you to do, is find your best pair of sunglasses. And when you're struggling this week, even on a cloudy day, just put them on. And you might just wear them for a few minutes. But that act of putting those glasses on might remind you, I have a filter that's already existing. And I have a choice to put a different filter on. I have a frame that's already surrounding the picture. But I have a choice to frame it with something different. And I can choose to see this through the lens of God will never abandon me. God will not fail me. I can live my life, all of my life, how Paul lived his, and choose 
to see God in all of it. You don't have to wear them all day. Don't be that guy there, that gal that wears sunglasses inside. Nobody likes that person. I'm just kidding. If you've, somebody's going to be mad. I'm, I'm just kidding. But just for a few minutes, just for a few, reframe the situation. Change the meaning of what's going on and see it different forever. You can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. The team's going to come out in just a minute and sing a song for us. Um, but I, I, I want to challenge you, just before they do, I want to challenge you with this idea. Jesus, even more than Paul, had the ability to reframe the most dire of circumstances for something else. The cross is the ultimate reframe. Think about this. The cross was the most brutal form of capital punishment that has ever existed to this day. It is the most brutal way to end someone's life. And Jesus was nailed to this cross, died a criminal's death that was more suffocating on his own bodily fluids than anything else. But you and I don't see the cross as that. You and I see the cross as hope. You and I see the cross as forgiveness. You and I see the cross as wholeness. Because Jesus reframed what it was all about. And instead of a brutal death, he turned it into the ultimate act of love. So this is our faith. This is our faith. So the team will come out, but, but I want you to think about this. You determine the meaning of what happens to you. Let Jesus help. Let Jesus help. And so we're going to sing this song, and, but I, I want you to have an opportunity today to take a step towards this reframe of how things look. And, and it's as simple as this. Pull out your phone. Text the word reframe to 847 558 1996. This doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is that you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. That's what we read. Black, black ink on white paper. But what we want to do is come alongside of you and help you with the next steps in reframing the things in your life that you're not proud of reframing the things in your life you wish you could do away with. And so I encourage you, while this song is played for you, that you might take that step. And here's the song. It's called New Wine. It's new to me. Um, it's, it's probably going to be new to you. But I love the words of it. Because it talks about the process of making wine. And that one of the steps means crushing the fruit. And so in our lives, what we have to do is trust that in the hardest days, God's making something beautiful. And in the hardest days, God's making something good. In the hardest days, God's doing something.